Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks for tuning in to the seventh class in our summer series where we're focused in 2 Corinthians. This is our final lesson together and Charlie selected for us the topic of thorn in the flesh as found in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 verses 1 through 10. There's a bit of background stuff here that we need to be talking about, so I'm going to go ahead and get our presentation fired up, and that way we can jump into the text. We need to talk about why Paul is feeling the need to boast. We'll talk about being a fool or being foolish, and I'll explain some of those concepts here, and they're kind of relative to our text. So I'll be reading in the ESV, again, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 10. I must go on boasting. Though there is nothing to be gained by it, I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who, 14 years ago, was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. On behalf of this man, I will boast, but on my own behalf, I will not boast except of my weaknesses. Though if I should wish to boast, I would not be a fool, for I would be speaking the truth, but I refrain from it, so that one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. So to keep me from being conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from being conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities, for when I am weak, then I am strong. So as I mentioned in the introduction there, we need to talk a little bit here from a background standpoint about this idea of boasting and also being foolish or dealing in folly here. And that's because we kind of skipped over a pretty important part of text in regards to our previous lessons. We went all the way from chapter seven to now all the way to chapter 12 here in one week, and we haven't covered any of that in between there. We've mentioned in previous classes how Paul was dealing with false teachers. He would mockingly call them super apostles, and they needed these letters of recommendation, which we've already talked about. And they were really trying to discredit Paul. And they probably would have they need to boast to really build themselves up and then also to try to uh, tear Paul down. And Paul didn't really want to get into this boasting game. And he didn't really look at this as, as something positive. And that's why you'll see boast mentioned several times in here. And he also talks about it being foolish or folly, depending on your translation. The Greek word apparently can be translated into stupidity, but it can also be uh, translated into that of being egotistical. And I think that's probably what Paul was shooting for here, is that he didn't want to really build himself up, his, his own ego, by doing all of this boasting and to really talk about himself. But because all of these quote-unquote super apostles were doing it, he felt the need to go ahead and do some of that himself. And if you really want to look at this more, uh, I encourage you to take a look at chapter 11. You'll see Paul talking a whole lot more about the folly of, of this and boasting and whatnot. And Paul is going to spend a pretty significant chunk of chapter 11 talking about his sufferings, uh, the various things that he had to endure for Christ's sake. Here in chapter 12, you see we jump right in where Paul's saying, I must go on boasting. And what he's doing is he's transitioning from that of talking about his suffering to now talking about at first appears to be some third person kind of thing, some man that saw a vision. And it seems that Paul is so uh, concerned about boasting that perhaps this is why in, in humbleness he chose to mention it the way that he did. But it's clear when you get down to verse 7 that he's really talking about himself. Uh, he's the one that would have seen this vision. And the vision that he's going to see here is going to be something that is, is amazing. But before we get into that, let's just take a quick look at some of the reasons that Paul could boast. 
Uh, I'm not going to read all of these on here, and there's a bunch of scriptures that you can go look up if you wanted to. Uh, Paul was called out as an apostle. Uh, we know that he was a Roman citizen. We know that he saw Christ in a vision. So there's lots of things that Paul could boast about, and these are just a sampling of the various things that, that Paul could draw upon. But what he's going to do in this particular section is he's going to draw upon this idea of um, him being caught up, as he calls it, into the third heaven. The third heaven, as we know it, would be the abode of God. Uh, the first heaven is going to be right here, the atmosphere, the, the air that we're breathing. The second heaven, if we were to look at it, is going to be what we would consider outer space, where the stars hang out, the sun, uh, those kind of things, etc. And then the third heaven, again, would be the abode of God. And it appears that from what Paul is state, stating here that he was caught up into some kind of vision. He didn't know if it was in the body or out of the body, but he saw some things. And whenever I see something like this, this is one of those things that I immediately will dismiss when I see someone mentioning it in the outside world. And uh, this is an example. Some of you may know uh, this uh, book. You may have even read it yourself. And this is a story, it's Alex Malarkey, and he uh, went into a coma at the age of six. He was in a car wreck and he spent a couple months there in a coma. And when he came to, he had all kinds of revelations and he also talked about how he went to heaven. And it later came out uh, in 2012 that it was all a lie, it was a hoax. He said, I didn't go to heaven. Uh, I just said I went to heaven because I thought it would get me some attention. And that's usually whatever I, I think is going on when, when something like this happens. I hear about someone seeing a bright light. They may very, very well have seen that, but I'm thinking, you know, if the apostle Paul went to heaven in some form or fashion, saw things there, and he heard things that man cannot utter, then I really question whether or not someone can say that, yeah, I went to heaven and here, let me tell you all about it. The other thing that I tend to immediately dismiss is going to be this type of uh, proclamation where someone says, yes, this is when Jesus is going to return. I have done the math. I've done the research or whatever it might be. And this is one of the many uh, failed uh, attempts here where people have said that Jesus is going to return on such and such day and year and whatnot. And uh, Jesus himself is going to make the statement there. It's in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 36. But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. So again, whenever I see someone talking about, hey, I went to heaven and here's what it was like, or I hear someone talking about uh, the, the end of the world as we know it, then, well, I just pretty much dismiss those things. And Paul, as we see in our text here this morning, says that he went and he saw this and he heard things, but he can't really tell us anything about it. And that's really the background for what's going on here. And that's going to lead us into our next part of the text, which is in verse 7, where we get this phrase that we're using, the stone in the flesh, and the way it's translated in the ESV, a thorn was giving me in the flesh. And we see that this thorn... Uh, is something that if we really wanted to, we've got about 12 or so minutes left here, we could spend the rest of the time trying to go through all of the various theories about what the thorn might have been. Uh, we could even find some scriptural support for these various things. Uh, a lot of folks would lean heavily towards it being some kind of eye problem. Uh, we know that Paul on the road to Damascus saw the bright light and maybe it literally blinded him for the three days, but maybe it had some lingering effects too. Uh, there, there's some theories around that. It's some support out of Galatians for a couple references. Uh, there's others that are much more exotic in their potential theories on Paul's thorn. Uh, they would suggest that, well, you know, Paul writes a lot about sex. So maybe he had to deal with temptations and, and a lot of sexual immorality and lust and things like that. Uh, there's others that would say, no, take it right here, literally. Um, Obviously, we're being figurative when we talk about a thorn in the flesh, but now I guess we're supposed to change and be literal and say it was a messenger of Satan. A messenger would be that of like an angel or as we would think of it in, in Satan's uh, uh, sense here, a demon. So maybe a demon followed Paul around. 
I don't really care to, to spend time this morning really contemplating all of these things. Again, we could debate uh, various ones, go try to find scriptures and try to prove this with the Greek or that with the Greek or whatever. But I think it's much more important to understand why Paul had this particular thorn, whatever it was, and also uh, what the result was. And then is there application for us today? Because that's really what I like to do whenever I'm teaching these kinds of classes. So that's going to be our, our focus here. And let's take a look at that first question. Why did Paul have a thorn? And you see this brought out in verse 7. I highlighted kind of the, the beginning and the end of the verse. It seems that Paul was given this thorn in the flesh. Again, whatever it was, some physical thing, some mental thing, some spiritual thing, we don't know. Uh, God doesn't tell us, and I think there's a reason why he doesn't, because he doesn't want us to focus on the thorn and to somehow maybe, oh, yeah, I had the same thorn Paul did, so maybe uh, that makes me somehow better qualified or whatever. But he wants us really to focus on why Paul had the thorn. And I see that brought out here, and it was a pride thing. We see that Paul is going to have these great revelations, and they uh, were surpassingly great. I mean, these were things that nobody had seen before, and nobody had heard before some of these things, apparently. And these were things that, again, uh, could not be uttered. And to keep Paul from becoming proud, to keep him from getting the big head or whatever term you want to use here, uh, he was given this thorn in the flesh to keep him from being conceited. So that seems to be one of the first reasons that Paul was giving this. Another one that I think we can kind of imply is going to come out of the first part of verse 9, where we see that three times Paul is going to be praying for this thing to be removed, and here's God's answer my grace is sufficient for you. So it seems like this is a constant reminder for Paul every time that this thing, again, whether it's spiritual, whether it's mental, whether it's physical, is a reminder, oh yeah, I've got God's grace, and that helps me to endure whatever this uh, thing is. And I get the idea that this potentially was something that plagued Paul perhaps the rest of his life. Uh, we think that this was written somewhere around AD 57, so maybe 10 more years uh, that, that Paul would have endured this, and maybe he's had it ever since the 14 years ago. So maybe this has been going on for 20 plus years, uh, or will go on for 20 plus years in Paul's life, uh, to, to, to again, be this constant reminder of God's grace. A third thing that I see brought out here is gonna be in the second part of verse nine, I highlighted that, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And if you were with us back in week three, we talked about jars of clay. And I asked a rhetorical question. Have you ever thought to yourself, why doesn't God use me more? And I suggested perhaps it's because myself, yourself, we're too strong. God doesn't have an opportunity to shine out from our jar of clay because we're so busy putting on the perfect image that the world can't see us. The world can't see God, that is, through us. So perhaps uh, God needs to introduce this thorn in the flesh in Paul's life to really illustrate the cracks, to really illustrate the, the fragile nature, the, the struggles, whatever it was that Paul was dealing with, so that the power of Christ could rest upon Paul and people could see that whenever they looked at him or heard him or saw him enduring whatever, again, this, this thorn was. So those are some things that I, I thought of this week that kind of came to my mind as to why this was important. The next thing that got me thinking here along these lines is in regards to thorns. And, and we think about these thorns in the flesh. I, I wondered, is a thorn in the flesh a trial? And I think the answer there is resoundingly yes. Uh, I think that's easy to, to see that a thorn in the flesh is something that you have to endure, that you have to uh, go through. And again, this could be a continual kind of thing, and perhaps it was for the rest of Paul's life. So that also got me to thinking about this, is a trial. And if we use perhaps some of the phrases that come out of our text, Paul would say a weakness, an insult, a hardship, a persecution, a calamity. Are, are those things, those trials, are they necessarily a thorn in the flesh? And here is where I would probably say maybe. Uh, I would also use the safe college answer of, well, it depends. 
And that's because I don't think, and, and I don't want to be too uh, semantic here and try to split hairs when we say thorn versus uh, a trial. Uh, are, are they two different things? But I do think when we look at this particular text, it seemed like it was something specific that Paul was given, and it was given for a reason. So to me, that got me to thinking is, well, how do I know? If, if this trial that I'm going through is really a thorn or is it just really a trial? So this is one of the things that uh, um, got me to thinking here. Have you had any direct revelation from God? Now, I don't want to be too facetious. We talked about that in the past of using that big word. But uh, I think it's possible for God to reveal himself to you and to explain something, but I don't think it's too probable. So I'm not too concerned about this one here. Uh, the next one, though, might be something that could be uh, something for us to consider in regards to whether or not something you're enduring is a true thorn. Do you have areas of pride in your life? Are there things where you're so concerned with the perfect social media image uh, you're so concerned with your position, your wealth, your uh, whatever vehicle. I mean, there's lots of things in which we can take pride in, your, your kids, uh, you know, your hobbies, whatever it might be. Is that something that you're so focused on that perhaps God does need to put something in your life, this thorn in the flesh, just like he did Paul, to keep you from being conceited? Another area that I would consider is, do you need a constant reminder of your weakness? and then also that of God's grace. That's where I would see perhaps an addiction, maybe even a continual sin of some sort that you're struggling with. That could be a, a thorn in the flesh. It could be something where, yeah, you just don't get it. So you haven't figured out why that's going on in your life. So I'm gonna to continue to allow that to happen. And that's going to be a, a continual reminder to you, to me, to, to all of us here, that you're weak and that you need God's grace. You need God's forgiveness. And you're not strong enough to overcome this on your own. You really need God's help in this matter. So those are some of the things here that I would uh, really think about in regards to thorns versus trials. And I don't, again, want to get too wrapped around the axle here, trying to, to separate the two, and, and maybe they're the same thing. But I would like to look at one other lesson that we can really pull out of this. And that's going to be found uh, in the verses that we've looked at here already in verses 9 and 10. And it's Paul's attitude. How did Paul handle whatever this thing was? And I see him here in verse 9 that he talks about he's going to gladly uh, boast about his weakness, and then he's going to be content with all of those things that I called trials earlier, the weaknesses, the insults, the hardships, the persecutions, and the calamities. Rather than bearing up under this thing and using it as a reason to be grumpy, to complain, to let everybody around you know that, yeah, I got to endure this. This is my thorn. This is my cross or my burden I have to bear, uh, you know, bear or carry here. That's not the way that Paul did this. Uh, Paul has contentment uh, in God's strength. He has contentment here uh, in, in his attitude. And I think that's a great example for us and something really for us to focus on uh, this morning. And when we look at, at Paul's thorn, uh, it's clear he wanted it removed. He prayed on three different occasions, and he was fortunate, and uh, perhaps I shouldn't use fortunate here, but I should use the word blessed. He was blessed to have God directly answer him. I don't know that we'll have that same kind of answer today. We might get a no in that there's just no response, or we might get a not now in that it takes days, weeks, months, years before whatever it is that we're enduring is removed. But I would like to draw upon Albert Barnes and his commentary. He makes this statement. We should never assume that a no answer to our prayers indicates a lack of God's care, a lack of his awareness about our plight, or a lack of his love or empathy for us. And I'll also add that a, a not now response uh, would be in the same vein here, that God knows what we're going through. It's not that he doesn't care, but he in his infinite wisdom understands why this trial or this thorn, whatever it might be, is put before us. 
And that wraps up our lesson. So I don't have anything for you to show for next week because I will not be presenting here next week. Uh, but I've enjoyed our time together and I would like to close as has been the tradition here, uh, focusing on Paul's words as we find them in 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 14. This is how Paul ended his letter to the Corinthians and how I will choose to end our time together here. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all.